My name is Connor Buckley and I'm the founder of Human Collective. We are a sustainable Irish clothing brand. Um, firstly, Saoirse, thank you so much for having us. Um, today there will be three speakers. Um, so um, I'm myself, um, Patrick Smith and Momobo Ogoro. So you won't have to listen to me for too long. Um, I set up Human Collective where well, we went live um, last November 8th. Um, it was a, a, a crazy time um, for us because we were um, couldn't believe the, the amount of um, interest people had in the brand. Um, we've been very fortunate in the sense that we've got lots of publicity from lots of different people. And I think what's been very interesting is that we, we've seen a, a kindness from people um, towards the brand. So I'm going to show you a little bit, tell you a little bit about the brand that I'm going to pass you on to Momobo and she's going to talk about diversity, inclusion and prejudice. So Human Collective first started, or I guess it was first born to my head on the 25th of May, 2020. Now, I don't know if anyone knows why that date is significant, the 25th of May, 2020. Well, it's when um, a man called George Floyd in America was murdered by a policeman. So he was a black man um, that was, um, you might have seen, was suffocated to death. And it really struck a chord with me. Um, my mum's black and my dad's white. And I think it struck a chord with people all over the world. And you could see those various different marches, the Black Lives Matter movement um, really sprung into force. And I realized that um, prejudice and discrimination wasn't something that just had to be talked about for black people, but for people all over the world. So I, I, Human Collective stands for equality. And our logo is a very simple equal sign, as you can see here. We don't have any other logos on our jumper except Human Collective Arc brand logo on the back neck. And we wanted to keep the message very subtle because originally I saw a lady in America called Jane Elliott. And Jane um, was a, an, an adversity and an educator. She, she created a jumper that said, all human, um, there's only one race, the human race. And, and I felt the jumper was quite strong in the sense of its messaging, but I realized that the public probably wouldn't want to wear something like that every every day of the week. So that's why we, we decided to create a jumper that was quite subtle in its messaging. And that's where the equal sign came from. The other thing I really noticed was that a lot of a lot of companies, when they wanted to create a, a, a symbolic message, that they often decided to keep the, the price of the jumper as cheap as possible and to keep the quality of jumper as cheap as possible. And I felt like that cheapens the message of equality, that cheapens the message of uh, whatever the messaging is going to be. So we decided to work with really premium suppliers. And we also wanted to work, work with people who only made organic cotton or recycled polyester. So all our clothing is 100% sustainable. So the key thing for us was that the jumper would be comfortable, that people could really love the feel of the jumper, but also that people could wear the jumper 365 days a year because of the quality and it would last for years. And that's why Brown Thomas, and, uh, along with a number of other of, uh, department stores, want to get Human Collective in their stores. Um, the other thing what we wanted to do was we wanted to make sure we're, our whole mission is to spread a message of equality. So we decided that we would um, not only create this jumper, but that we create future products that would have slightly stronger messaging, messaging. And that would help to educate people. We didn't want to come across like we're a company that just was there to preach at people because we're understanding this and learning as we go as well. We'd like to think that we're going on a journey with people. And, and that's why our team is made up of people who are um i made up people from the lgbt community Um, paddy will talk in a minute he's right he's been the face of disability in many ways Um, hi laura uh laura's left a message here thank you very much um um we've decided that we wanted to work with people that could educate us as well so that's why Mimobo, who's going to speak in a couple of minutes and um, she's working with us as well and she'll tell you a little bit about her background so Human Collective, our mission is to spread a message of equality. How do we do this? We have an equal sign. Why does that make a difference? Well, studies have shown that when people make a small commitment to something, they're more likely to stand with that commitment. And what that means is that by wearing this jumper, you're saying you're standing up for equality. But also when, that, when, when, when moments in life where that presents itself, you're more likely to stick to those, um, those beliefs. So there's a famous study done where, it's, it's, I guess it's part of nudge psychology, whereby... Um, a neighborhood was asked, would you erect a sign saying drive safely? And most people don't want to erect a sign in their driveway or in their garden saying drive safely. So everyone, so everyone said no to this. They went to the next neighborhood and they said, would you mind putting a postcard in your window saying drive safely? And something like 80% of people said, yeah, we'll put this postcard in the window saying drive safely. They went 
back to that same neighbourhood who agreed to put in the small postcard and said, would you now put a, a sign in that would say drive safely? And you would think that most people wouldn't want to put that sign in saying drive safely. But as, a, as it happened, 50% of people agreed to put a drive safely sign in their driveway. And what that shows us, that shows us that when people make a small commitment to something, they're more likely to follow on that, that principle. And we believe that what, this is a small commitment people make by wearing our, our hats or our jumpers or our t-shirts. And that means that people are more likely to stick with that. And what do we want that to happen? Well, success for us looks like if you're in a, a dynamic and someone said something that was racist or sexist or homophobic, that you would be an ally to that person or you would stop the conversation and say, that's unacceptable. Now, that's really difficult to do. Um, uh, I've been in that situation a couple of times where racist remarks have been said to me. And it's very difficult for me to come back and say something or indeed someone else in the, in the, in the room or in our company to say it. But what we do want is when I've seen it happen before, it's really powerful. And what makes it really powerful is if the victim doesn't say it. So that's where allyship comes in. And what allyship is about is if someone says something that's not appropriate, that someone else, not the victim, would say, look, you can't say that. That's not right. It can be really difficult. You can be in a family situation where you might turn around to a granny or granddad and go, you can't really say that anymore, gran like granny or mom or dad. You just can't say that. And I've been in that situation where I've had to say that to family members. And um, it's difficult. It's not easy. But I think it shows great strength. And that's what, what it's all about. Um, when we talk about strength, I'm going to briefly talk about where this came from as well. My mum, her, her name was Christine Buckley. She was an activist and a campaigner. She, over a 25-year period, helped to, um, I guess, uh, expose abuses in, in the church. So Christine was first, in 1992, was on the Gay Burn Show. Um, she talked about how she'd been abused in, in orphanages um, and from that, there was a flood of phone calls and letters and, and it really uh, exposed the, uh, the institutional abuse. That led to Bertie O'Hearn in 1999 publicly apologising to victim, victims of institutional abuse. Um, uh, it also led to the 2011 Ryan Report, which vindicated everything that had been said. So this had been a 25-year battle for my mum. Um, she, along, the, along the way, she obviously, there was lots of ups and downs. Some of her proudest moments was that public apology from Bertie Hearn, but also winning Woman of the Year. Uh, she won European Volunteer of the Year, um, which was, a, which was um, an amazing achievement. Um, but those achievements, it wasn't about that for her. It was about helping people who had been, who had been abused and had been marginalised in their lives. And um, that's what we want to do. We want to help people in, in ways. And um, I don't think I'm, this, this, this company will ever achieve what she achieved but i hope um that she'd be if she was alive today now she'd be very proud of what we're trying to do so um there's a little bit about human collective as i said we're 100 sustainable we're an irish brand and um, there's going to be a code that you can guys can get you know 15 percent off and um, which should come up at the end it's uh, it's iconic 15 anyway if you ever want to uh, look at our, our website it's we are human collective.com um, so this has been an amazing journey for us and we hope that we're going to have some stronger messaging on our jumpers in the future. Um, as I said, we're crew neck jumpers, hoodies, uh, t-shirts. We're going to have shorts out as well. Um, but for now, I'm going to pass you on to Momobo. Um, she's a lot more interesting than me. And uh, thank you so much for listening, guys. We really appreciate it. Have a great week. Sorry, just trying to unmute myself there and trying to find the unmute button. So thanks a million for that, Connor. It was an amazing story and the brand that and Human Collective itself um, is striving toward equality, like Connor said. A bit about myself, I am a psychologist and um, I'm sure a lot of you know what a psychologist is, but in the field of psychology, there is a vast array amount of different types of psychologists um, around the world. So what I am and what I do is I do social psychology, which is the study, social psychology is the study of how humans affect, how humans are affected and are affected by the social and physical environments. So the reason I kind of got into this area and I'm doing my PhD, I'm in the final year of my PhD in the University of Limerick. The reason I got into this area is because I was kind of fascinated by the idea of hate. I will always ask the question as one of those kids that are, was always curious, why is this happening? Why is this happening? 
And I was always curious about the question as, as to why people hate. As you're aware, this, this kind of sparked from personal experiences that happened in my own life. My family migrated from Nigeria when I was three and I grew up in rural Wexford um, um, in the late 90s and early 2000s. So those we had certain experiences that you, you can understand as, let's say, xenophobic, let's say anti-migrant, let's say racism as well, that really pushed me into the area and questioning as to why people hate. So as a result, um, I, I got into the area of social psychology to really understand the human behavior that goes behind racism, prejudice, discrimination, and how marginalized communities can be supported um, in, in when they come across these environments or situations. So one of the reasons why, why um, individuals end up into this sort of um, group-based dynamics where we, we, we may not um, be, be as open to people who are different towards us or in, in different communities is this concept of, that we, we as psychologists calls, call social identity. So this is a person's self-concept based on their membership to social groups. So this can be, let's say right now, you probably have your hats on as um, iconic office users, or, or right now I have my hat on as um, human collective um, diversity and inclusion, and inclusion advisor, or this can be loads of different social identities that you have in your, in your life. So let's say religion, your nationality, your occupation, your sexual orientation, your ethnic group, your gender, or even the football club you like. Each and every one of us have social identities and these are the things that guide our human behavior. Oftentimes we think that our, that our identity is like the thing that we create ourselves. But the actual fact is it is that it's guided by our human behavior, our, our social groups. And each of us have different social groups that, that inform how we behave uh, and how we react to different certain um, situations. To my next slide there. So a bit about the theory, I don't want to bore all of you as well regarding this, but I think it's really interesting to understand how because of your social identity and your social group, this may, out, this may have an outcome of, let's say, um, prejudicial behavior, discrimination of people that are not, not in your social group. And this is often exa exacerbated when those communities are of minority or marginalized communities. So a lot of the social identity theory is often guided by, um, he's kind of like the father of social identity. His name is um, Henry Tashvel. And he came about with this theory that shows that we and individuals in our social group, we have what do we call an in-group. So this is people in our social environment or the group that we really understand. So when you think of yourself, let's say as Irish, you're in the in-group of Irish and you understand all the intricacies that come with being Irish. And then you have your out-group and this out-group is, is the group that is not within the in-group. So I don't know, the UK, they're not in the Irish in-group because they're our out-group. And oftentimes when we have our in-group, it's often linked to our emotions. And as humans, we want to be proud of who we are. We want to feel good. These are just intrinsic to who we are. And when we have that in-group tied to our emotions, we may feel some kind of way when somebody attacks that in-group or somebody says something bad about that in-group or um, feelings and emotions towards that out-group as well. So because our, our in-group is so tied to our emotions, we may have a bias towards that in-group and people that are not in that in-group, may may, we may deem them as, let's say, an other, different, or I don't understand them. And in some, in some sort of extreme circumstances, they may, that may be deemed as sort of prejudicial behavior, that may be deemed as all the isms that go around in society, sexism, racism, um, um, homophobia, and all that kind of things particularly because it's very, because our social identities are linked to our emotions. And this can be, again, nationalism, sexism, all the isms in society. So I kind of want you to think of your social identities. What social identities do I have in my everyday life? This can be your football club, your nationality, your sexuality, your marital status, all these kinds of things affect who you are and who you are not as well. And this can affect your human behavior as to how you, how you treat groups that are not in your immediate social um, identity or social group. So the strength and the salience of your social identity can be activated in different, in different circumstances. So right now, as we're talking about, let's say, prejudice or racism or things like that, your, your, the strength of your racial identity or your ethnic identity may be, may be coming forth right now because we're talking about it and it's being primed as well. So the strength and salience of your social identity can be activated with situations, like Connor mentioned, when someone talks about 
um, discrimination and you feel some sort of way and you want to want to combat it, that's your social identity as like a human coming across or that racial or ethnic identity coming across. And it got off to be, it can be guided by experiences or even by what you wear. So I was explaining previous to Connor that there's a lot of psychological research that shows that um, it's called priming research. It shows that when individuals are primed or when they are shown something about their human identity or something that they should be linked with or something that makes them like act as a good person, I guess, if, for example, wearing something that um, espouses equality, they're often the strength and salience of that social identity is put into different, situa different situations. So again, I want you to think of the social identities and how they affect um, you and how they, how they may affect other communities in your environment as, as well. So again, like I spoke, because we have these social identities and because we have this in-group bias, there can be an, a thing that happens when we may, be, we may see people that are outside our, our in-group as something different, something other, and in different circumstances, it can be a threat and it can be something that we may fear as well. And this can count outcome in what we call prejudice. So I'm sure a lot of you know um, what prejudice is and I can go a full day long, day long seminar on prejudice and the research behind it. But prejudice can be understood in many different facets, not just the main, the main general thing that we kind of see. So I'm just gonna give you a brief, brief touch on the three different types of prejudice that we look at as social psychologists. So it can be group-based prejudice, and this is the one that most people kind of understand as the negative attitudes towards another person or group formed in advance of any sort of knowledge or experience with that person or group. So this is the general idea of prejudice that we have when someone just makes an, an assumption about a group or a person without actually really knowing them. But other concepts and other ideas of prejudice come from this idea of fairness. So when we talk about prejudice as social psychologists, we look at the idea of fairness as perceptions or treatment of a group that is inaccurate, unjustified, or overgeneralized. So um, because, because as a society, we agree within ourselves that certain actions are fair or just or accurate. For example, I was talking to Patty there the other day as, as a society, we agreed that a wheelchair ramp is fair, just, and, in, and accurate, and it's not unfair because it creates an equitable society for people who are disabled. Whereas there are other things that we, we deem as not fair, unjust, inaccurate, and that would be considered prejudice. So, and prejudice is often guided by this idea of privilege as well. And how privilege, and this comes with histories of colonialism, um, histories of um, um, loads of other things as well, how privilege, example, race, racial, gender, sexuality, class can influence how we ourselves and others within our, our group or outside our social and cultural groups are, are affected in society. So for example, um, we were talking about the, N uh, I was talking about the N-word previously with, Con um, with uh, Patty as well as like, okay, why is it fair that um, people of color or black people can say the n-word and, um, and white people or, or people who are racialized as white cannot say the n-word this goes about this this goes about with this idea of privilege um, privilege under under the guise of pre prejudice as well because of the histories that go behind that word as well so these are the sort of three understandings of sort of prejudice that we have in society and how we as social psychologists kind of look into these as well. Again, I can give you a full, if you want more research around it, definitely come back to me and I can give you more. But this is Jesus, just some, of, some initial understandings of prejudice as well. So how do we reduce prejudice? So prejudice can be reduced in so many different ways. I'm gonna go through just some easy ways that you as an individual or your immediate social group can do it, but yet we can understand that prejudice can be reduced in a social setting, but in the wider, more context, context more structural uh, change as well. But for the pers purpose of this presentation, just I'm just gonna talk about the, the immediate social um, settings that you can use to reduce your own prejudice and the prejudice within your, um, within your social group. And one thing to note is that every one of us has prejudice. If you don't have prejudice, you're not a human being. So it's important to note that every one of us has prejudice and it's important that we constantly reflect on the prejudices and biases that we have in order to move forward together. And as Ireland is becoming more and more multicultural, it's important to often reflect on these things in our everyday behavior. So what you can do to reduce prejudice is to stay curious. So by the fact that you're in this meeting already, is, is a step towards moving against prejudice and moving towards equality. The fact that you are in this meeting and the fact that you are being curious about this issue from the get-go is a step, more to, a step towards equality as well. 
and being curious about these sort of social issues. And um, educating yourself is really important. And again, back to this idea that Connor was saying that you, we don't want marginalized communities always having to educate, always having to speak, always have to advocate. So it's important if you want to become an ally in these sort of um, issues, you need to educate yourself, um, read, watch videos, talk to, talk to people, really know the issues that may be affecting communities rather than always having the communities fend for themselves um, in these areas. Um, and another thing that you can do is reevaluate your beliefs and, and values. So something that may be really hard within ourselves is because we have the beliefs that we've grown up since we were X amount of years old. And um, those things are kind of stuck with us. But sometimes as we reflect on other people's experiences and how, how other people see the world, it's really important for us to, in a non-judgmental way, really look at the values and the beliefs we have and actually question ourselves as to, is this actually an equal or fair belief to have? Is this something that I believe or I was taught to believe? And that can actually strive towards us being more open-minded, which is the last point that we have here, being more open-minded and open to hearing um, the different experiences and stories without having this defensive defensiveness or guise up um, when, you, when it comes to people of different backgrounds. And what your social group can do is um, healthy intergroup dialogue. So having conversations, I'm, I am one of those people that conversations is the key to, to unity. Like having conversations with people that are different to you is, the, is one of the best tools for reducing prejudice. Having conversations in different, with people from different um, religions, their sexualities, um, classes, it's really great way just to, and be asking, asking open questions, it's really great way to just to, hear their stories and really understand the humanity behind each one of us because we have our social identities we have our social groups we have all these things that guide who we are but at the end of the day we're all human beings that are worthy of dignity and respect so we need to create positive group interactions with each other so there are things as humans that we all love for example you know food music dance these things are things that we can have positive interactions with each, other, with each other. And through these things, we can actually come together and create spaces where we can be more equal, an equal society. Hearing each other's stories, stories are intrinsic to humanity. That's the way history has been, <laughs> has transcended throughout, throughout the world. And that's the way we actually engage uh, with each other. Humans are, are are innate to storytelling. This is really important to how we actually engage with each other. So be open to hearing people's story and hearing where they come from, their perspective, even if it doesn't sit right 100% with you, be open to at least hearing those stories and listen to, listen to understand rather than retaliate. Sometimes um, we, again, this goes back to the beliefs that we've grown up with. Sometimes we, we, we want to defend our belief systems or we want to defend everything that we, we we've grown up with we engaged with but in order to reduce prejudice and really see put yourself in the other in the shoes of the other person it's really important to listen to understand their perspective even though you may not agree with it rather than retaliate so you can actually see the humanity behind who they are so I think that's everything from me right now. Um, if I wasn't an academic, I wouldn't do this, but always love to give people some further reading in case they want to, to, to go into any of it themselves because it's important, again, educating yourself. It's important to um, go further with that if you, if, you, if you feel like you want to do so. So right now I'm going to um, pass it to Paddy who's actually going to share one of, um, some of his stories as to his experience um, um, in Ireland as well. So Paddy, over to you. Thank you so much, Momo. That is fascinating. I don't know how I'm going to like go on from that. I, I want to give you my 15 minutes and let's see you keep talking. Um, but how amazing was that? And also, Connor, I think your mom would be very proud of you. Um, so my name is Paddy Smith and I am the head of community for Human Collective. So what does that mean? I basically help on social and corporate levels. Um, so I was born with cerebral palsy in my legs. Um, my mom passed away from cancer of the womb when I was inside her. Um, so it was loss of oxygen to the head. And the thing about cerebral palsy is you only actually develop it within the birth canal. So a crazy fact is that I actually, if I got a C-section, more than likely would have been saved because the loss of oxygen to my brain actually created the cerebral palsy that I have. And cerebral palsy is a, is a wide spectrum, you know, and the, the quicker you're saved, 
the more, uh, you know, the less damage is done. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but one in seven people are disabled. That could be a hidden disability or a physical disability within our uh, community. And that is a massive, massive stat that people don't realize. And 50% of people within the workforce, 50% try to hide their disability, whether it's a physical one or an invisible one, from their employer, from fear. So that is also a massive stat because people are scared to showcase that they're disabled because they feel that from research I've done that, you know, uh, employers look at them differently. They'll feel like they won't be able to get the job done or, you know, they'll just be looked at differently from their peers. So that is a scary, scary thing to think about that we are, we are trying to create a workforce where we're all equal, but disabled people sometimes feel like they're put on the back foot of that because disability, for some reason, people are scared of um, and it doesn't really get the voice that I think it deserves. So when Connor came to me and asked me to be head of community of Human Collective, I was already, I do a lot of uh, disabled activism uh, through my Instagram, uh, you know, a lot of talks. And, you know, I, I try to put myself forward on media because when I was growing up, I never saw anyone like me who was on media, who was in media. So it really, I, I felt like I was alone. And um, so when Connor came to me and, and, and offered me this job, I really felt like, you know what, if you can see it, you can be it. And it really um, matches the ethos of what I'm trying to drive and the narrative I'm trying to change. And if I can, if a, if a young kid is following me or a parent who's following me, who, who has just been diagnosed with a disability, whether it's physical or invisible, they know now that, that their life it, it can, can still be amazing and they can still you know, go chase their dreams. And that's what I want to break the boundaries of here today. And that's why I, I want to be part of Human Collective because that's all it stands for. It's equality for all, whether it's gender, sexuality, disability, you know, where you're from, opportunity. So, and I, and I think it was really powerful that Mobo said, we all have prejudice, prejudice, and we do. We all have prejudice, but it's, it's, notify, it's noticing them and figuring out how we can change them or, you know, learning from them. So when I was uh, growing up, I was always taught that I wanted to fix my disability. I needed it, I needed it to be fixed from my parents to my dad to, you know, um, peers to social groups. They all wanted to fix me. So I had this idea that I was imperfect um, and I, I, was, I was broken because society wanted my disability to be fixed. But the funny thing about it is, is I never really wanted my disability to be fixed. I was fine with it. And I think that's a really like interesting fact because why, like what do I want to fix because society says so? Or do I want to fix it because I want it done? Um, and I tried to, and for a long time, I didn't accept that I was disabled. And then I was also coming to terms that I'm a gay man as well. So that intersexuality of being a disabled gay man in society is very difficult because it's all about image. A lot of gay world is all about image. And obviously I'm trying to come to terms with me being disabled as well. So I found, I found it very hard to find my space. Um, and I always felt like I wasn't going to achieve much because that's what I was taught from a young age that I wasn't really going to achieve anything. So it took me a long time to get the confidence to, to sit here with you guys today. You know, if I was five years old and you had told me that I would be doing these talks, I would have laughed in your face, you know. Um, and that was due to like, I when I was going for jobs when I was younger, I, I didn't, no one would hire me. And my dad used to say to me, that's because you're disabled. No one will hire you because you're, you're disabled. They won't say to you in the interview, but it, that's the cold world that we live in. And I'm so happy to say that we've moved forward, but there's still work to do. And um, my first job that I ever got was a commission-based role selling Paralympic pins on, on the streets of Dublin. Um, so I used to stand there for hours and hours selling Paralympic pins in the streets. And I wouldn't tell my dad that I um, did this job because of my pride. Do you know what I mean? I didn't want... I didn't want him to think that he was right and that was the only job I could get. But I actually got so good at that job that they offered me a full-time role as their event coordinator to try get the stands within um, shopping centres to close stores to 
So if you ever saw an Irish county stand or a Paralympic stand or um, an Irish Heart Foundation stand in a store, uh, I, that could have been made. that got it there. So that really taught me resilience and how to reframe my mind from thinking that my disability was a weakness to my disability being a superpower, you know? Um, and I think that's something that's really stood with me today. I look at my disability now as a superpower and if I can help anyone reframe their mind and, and just because society thinks it's weakness, it could actually be your biggest strength. Um, and I got that. I also then got headhunted by a tech company. But in this tech company, I, I really felt that I was misunderstood and out of place. You know, like a lesbian girl one time got um, a job there. And because I was gay, they thought we were going to be best friends. There are little microaggressions that happen and communications that shouldn't be said within the workforce because it's just, it, it's not true. Um, and also when I went on a team bonding day, there's a difference between not seeing my disability and not being aware it exists. This team bonding day, they brought me kayaking and archery, two things that I absolutely cannot do because I can't stand without my crutches for a long amount of time. And I don't have the core strength in my, um, in my abdomen to actually sit in the canoe. So what happened was they just plied me with wine for two hours and I just got drunk on the side watching all of them bond on the team bonding day and I didn't bond with any of them. I just bonded with a bottle of wine because they didn't know what to give me. So they just got me drunk, which is great. I look like we all love getting drunk, but like it was a team bonding day. It was, a, it was meant to be a work commitment. So then I went to them and I said, you know, I've, that's the, I've never felt so disabled in my life. And, you know, I just feel like you didn't really think about me when you were, when you were putting together this team bonding day. And they were like, they actually said back to me, they were like, oh, Paddy, get over it. You're fine. Do you know what I mean? You're fine. You're fine. And I just felt that really disrespectful and also just not, as the moment would say, hearing my story, hearing my side, you know, not understanding that I felt a certain way and kind of being defensive about what they did. Do you know what I mean? So, and this is only two years ago. So we all have this idea that Ireland is this accepting, you know, forward thinking place. But in reality, in a lot of ways, it's not. Do you know what I mean? Just because we got the barrage referendum over the line or the abortion doesn't mean we don't have issues that underline. And I think that, especially in social groups, um, you know, we're, we are scared to put ourselves forward and say, you know, that's wrong. Um, so how can, how can we get solutions to that? Really and honestly and truly, it is about listening more. Just listen. You don't have to get your opinion across. You don't just listen to another person's story. That, and I, that goes for me as well. I am not here to tell you that I know all the ways and that, you know, the way I think is right. I can only tell you my experiences. And from my experience, when I'm listening to the traveler community, for example, because I had prejudice when I realized and really talked to the traveler community, I realized I had prejudice towards them. Do you know what I mean? I had this idea of what they were like until I was put in a room with them and having to do an event with them. I realized, wow, I have prejudice towards that. Just because I'm part of a minority group doesn't mean I don't have prejudice. Do you know what I mean? And I think that we can all take a lesson from that um, and just sit with ourselves and think about what we are saying to people and our responses. Another thing I would say is go and educate yourselves, get books, watch shows. And um, we we all have this idea that you know when a disabled person the disabled person has to come to you and tell you what's right or the black person has to come to you and tell you about how to do this. No, if you want to be a part of it and you and you want to change your mindset, you can do that yourself. So I really feel that is something that we can bring to the forefront and a solution orientated aspect. And also within the workforce, you know, not to have an idea. And I think we've got this through the pandemic um, that not one, not one size fits all. Do you know what I mean? Have an idea that a diverse group and a diverse workforce creates a better atmosphere and a better environment for your business. And why wouldn't you want that? And that's why I think wearing what you believe and also 
saying what you believe coincides. And I think I'll leave it there today. Um, and thank you so, so much for your time uh, and for listening to us. Um, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, and yeah, God bless.